Hey everybody, and welcome back to the Tel Aviv MSP podcast. Uh, very, very excited to introduce our guest here today. Uh, Kinsey, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, I am uh, Kinsey Haynes, and I am the Chief Marketing Officer for Kirkham Iron Tech. Awesome. And a, a quick intro uh, for myself. Uh, hey everybody, I'm Jeremy, Head of Partnerships at Tel Aviv, and we help over 100 MSPs capture new prospects with a risk assessments a widget on their homepage and run automated risk assessments uh, to help them win new clients. Uh, MSPs like Halt Data Solutions, Trida Networks, and Level 5 Management use Tel Aviv to run risk assessments to win new clients, generate leads, book sales calls, uh, and help clients meet compliance. They also love Tel Aviv because they reduce risk assessments that take seven, eight days manually to under five hours automated with Tel Aviv. So let's jump right in, uh, Kinsey. Can we learn a little bit more about Kirkham um, and maybe who your customers are and your services? Yeah, so we service all over the United States. We have clients all over. Um, we are ideal prospect. We love working with law firms, any kind of like financial services, professional services, manufacturing, engineering, the list is long. We don't work with just like one niche. We, you know, uh, we can handle all the professional services out there and it's, uh, they need cybersecurity and they need help with IT. It's definitely something lacking. Um, we see that with most businesses that we do talk to. Um, and yeah. Interesting. Um, I'd love to dive deeper into the, the law firm persona. Um, yeah. I imagine law firms deal with very sensitive uh, information. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious, is compliance uh, a, a huge pain point for them? Security, data security? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's important. Um, they have different like regulations within the law industry mm -hmm. uh, regarding like safeguarding their data, but there's no teeth in it. And we see that with a lot of these regulations oh. out there. Like we worked with the water industry for a bit too. And they say like, yeah, you have to be compliant, but there's no one really ensuring that they're compliant they don't have to like prove it to anyone huh. um so we we don't like make a client compliant but we help them achieve compliance interesting um i'd love to uh float this uh, uh, this thing that we've been seeing by you and get your feedback we've been talking to several msps not in the legal space but in fintech and healthcare for those industries, uh, a lot of compliance regulations have been coming top down, whether by the government down to big, uh, big banks, big, big insurance companies, big uh, hospitals, healthcare providers, who then require small to medium businesses they work with to be compliant. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that, that sale, right, uh, that small to medium business needing compliance in order to close a deal, sign a contract, that being mm -hmm. the enforcer, is that... I'm curious, do you see um, any of that in legal or, or is that, uh, uh, you know, a, a totally different different situation there? It's it's different for sure. Um, the regulations that we see, like with law specifically, they're through the Bar Association. Mm -hmm. And of course, each state has a Bar Association. Um, like New York, for example, it's like RPC one point something you know they have their own regulations within the bar and being an attorney you have to be you know on a good standing with the bar mm -hmm. um and with you being a part of the bar association you have to have like continuing legal education and uh, that's something i'm sure like you'd love to like hear about the marketing side of things uh, -huh. uh we i would mention webinars we were speaking earlier uh, we do webinars with the bar associations um, and we provide any kind of content really that we can for the bar associations uh, regarding cybersecurity. So we do these um, webinars for the associations, strictly educational. They have to be, you know, can't be a sales pitch. And at the very end of the webinar, we just have our contact information on there. We offer that free security and risk assessment and say, hey, you know, oh, if you want to learn wow. more, if you want to learn how to protect your business, you know, contact us and we can make that happen. Very interesting. There's a lot I want to dive into. You mentioned marketing. <laughs> uh, you mentioned a little bit about risk assessments. Before yeah. that, I do want to dive into your sales process a little bit. You mentioned yeah. earlier, because there's no one really enforcing compliance, how does that mm. impact your business and your ability to sell or make them care? What do you do instead? Yeah. So, I mean, you would think that they'd come to us, I mean, saying like, oh, I like I need cybersecurity because I have to be compliant. That's how it is yeah. with some other industries. But mm -hmm. with the law, 
the law guys, they don't really, they're not coming to us saying that, you know, they're not coming to us saying, hey, I need to be compliant with this and this and this. So we, with the risk assessment, we just uh, huh. lay out everything for them plain and simple. You know, this is where you're lacking. This is where you're vulnerable. And uh, within the sales process, it's more of an educational thing um, because they obviously know they need it. But mm. it's, again, they're not coming to us because like, oh, we have to do this. Or, I mean, sometimes we'll see them with a cyber insurance policy and with the cyber insurance, they have to have proof that they're doing this, this, and this um, for the policy to be like work for them, so. I'm curious, uh, what are some of the major customer objections that you see uh, uh, law firms make? Is it, oh, we don't need it, right? And then is it a long educational process? Uh, oh. Hey, welcome, Tom. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Uh, you're on mute. Yeah, I'm not now. Sorry, guys. Hey. I, uh, I I got tied up on that interview, and uh, oh, no it, was, it was going too good. I had to sacrifice you. Sorry. Oh, no problem. No problem. We've <laughs> actually transitioned this into a, a, a dual uh, webinar with, with uh, Kinsey. We're learning a lot about marketing and sales and, and your uh, law firm persona very educational for our MSP audience. Um, Tom, would you like to turn on, turn your camera on and, and introduce yourself? I thought I did. Hang on, I don't know how to use computers. So <laughs> I don't know how to use Zoom either, apparently. Whoops, <laughs> no see, I see I turn it on, then I turn it off. <laughs> You're still not showing up. Yeah, it's probably got the wrong camera. Uh, no. Yeah, hang on. Just, yeah, I, no, I no worries. I got no it, worries. I got it. Oh, I'll hey. call Best Buy if I can't get it. Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you too. Uh, Tom, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, well, I'm Tom Kirkham, uh, founder, CEO, and acting chief information security officer of uh, Kirkham Iron Tech. Awesome. And just to catch you up, so Kinsey and I, we were talking about basically the messaging you have around uh, how you communicate to your law firm customer personas. We were just getting into understanding, you know, McKinsey mentioned a lot about education, approaching sales with education, educational webinars and content. When you even sit down, they know they need this. So we're going to just educate you and sort of guide you through the sales process. But my next question then is, so what are the customer objections that you typically find? In the educational process or part of it? Uh, yeah, part of your sales process talking to uh, legal firms, that, that persona. The vast majority of my presentation is it has to be educational when we, because they get continuing learning credits, right? They're required every year to have a certain number of attorneys, accountants, engineers, lots of professional service organizations have that. Well, when you go in front of a bar association with an educational course, it can't be about selling you. It can't mm. be... Yeah, I mean, if your unique selling proposition, which we have a good one, a well-defined one, uh, it, it's just part of a good process, right? Anybody could do this, but here's the right way to do it. So it's, it's important to understand that if you're going down that route. Now, we often have webinars that mm -hmm. we don't have those restrictions, right? Oh, and then okay. you, can, you, you can just say, well, look, we have a unique way that we assess your organization from an IT and a cybersecurity uh, perspective. And this is why it's unique. This is why this is really what you need, want, and it, in, it conforms to international standards. And most of our competition not only don't understand things and why corporate govern, governance is necessary and, and required, frankly, in the proper application of those two disciplines, cybersecurity and IT infrastructure. Uh, but it, it's, a, it's a really good, unique selling proposition, and it sets you apart from the crowd. Yep. And, and so it's, a, it's the proper, it, knowing the audience, what they're expecting, the worst thing you can do is go in front of somebody that's expecting to be educated. Yeah. And what they end up with is a 30-minute pitch for the next webinar or the – if you answer today, we'll give you 50% off and free onboarding fees. Yeah, it's like a timeshare presentation. <laughs> yeah, or a good marketing program presentation. Or, yeah. 
or all these things, like how to get on podcast interviews, right? <laughs> um, Tom, I, I want to ask you about uh, how you utilize risk assessments in your sales process. Kinsey mentioned that earlier, but Kinsey, I want to ask you a question here about the webinars. Mm -hmm. How, what gave you guys the idea to host webinars? Who's in your community? How does it work? And, and could you give us some examples of like upcoming webinars? What, what are they about? Yeah, well, before COVID, Tom was doing in-person presentations. Of course, when COVID hit, everything went virtual. So it was mm -hmm. just, I mean, immediately, okay, we got to switch it up. And a lot of the CLEs, I think they were doing most of them in person. Um, so that was a big change for at least like that industry and the continuing education industry. Um, so it kind of made it pretty easy for us to get in our company and like in front of people. Um, and to spread our message and to educate them. Um, upcoming webinars, we we really don't have that many for the rest of this year on the calendar, but it's just like an hour long presentation. Uh, Tom's most recent one, uh, it's a, kind of like a storyline, like a story about Joe's accounting firms, what we call it. Mm -hmm. And we yeah. kind of walk the audience through what could happen and an actual cyber attack, so like from the actual opening of the email with the malicious, you know, document and, and just the storyline of how it goes and what could happen and what could they learn from Joe's mistake and what he did wrong. Um, yeah. And it, it, of course, we talk about other things, too, like, OK, this is what you need to do. We go over NIST. Um, the We've been talking about the new NIST framework. It's not like officially out, I don't think but they have released like a draft that mentions governance, which Tom was talking about earlier. So we go into a whole bunch of different things. Interesting. Uh, uh, along the lines of Joe's storyline, Tom, could you share with us uh, what an example of that storyline is, perhaps even with uh, folks that you've, wor you've worked with in the past? Oh, I'd love to. And everybody likes to hear a good hacker story, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah so, uh, so storylines actually... Uh, an official term in our business and uh so as the acting chief information security officer uh whenever we any of our us or any of our clients have a security event uh the very first thing out of my mouth is what's the storyline right what do we know so far in the storyline and and the purpose of that is to understand the response the mitigation remediation processes uh it's also it, it's going to drive a lot of the post-mortem analysis you know, what all went wrong after everything's over with, you stopped it and they're back up and running. You always do a postmortem and you go back to the storyline. What was the threat vector? Where was the, if you practice defense in depth, which any good security firm should, what line of defense was too weak or what line of defense was pierced? And it's usually going to be humans, right? It's going to be a human <laughs> failure. Yeah. Uh, but there's others like firewall was pierced on this particular attack. The, the EDR failed for various reasons. And what was that reason? Is it a configuration? Anyway, it just walks you through that. But the, what a storyline is. And in the case of this example that Kenzie's talking about, Joe's accounting firm receives a phishing email. And this particular one is from Office 365 or Microsoft 365. And it email says there's suspicious activity on your account. Click here to review and approve it or deny it. You know, the typical stuff you get on, you know, suspicious activity. It looks 100% legit. I mean, it looks like the real thing. Joe clicks on it and it deploys a ransomware attack on his network. And that's kind of a storyline. And uh, to continue on that story, it's going mm -hmm. behind the scenes and everything, encrypting the files, and then it pops up the ransom demand. Mm -hmm. So. So what do you do? <laughs> well, in the case of Joe, because he didn't have the right defenses in place, he wasn't backed up by InfoSec professionals. He's using a consumer grade, off the shelf, internet protection suite which right. is not effective these days uh he's left with two choices restore from a backup pay the ransom that's it and he went to his backups and because they weren't monitored he found out not only had they failed two or three months earlier because nobody was checking them 
and all automated backup systems fail. Don't kid yourself. If there's one out there yeah. that never fails, let me know because I've been looking for 30 plus years. <laughs> um, but those were also encrypted. The backup files themselves. So you got to have a backup that's ransomware proof and is always monitored by humans, not just automated. And in Joe's case, he paid the ransom to get his files back. But then he had other fallout. He had to notify authorities. He had to notify the clients. He was required by law. And his clients started leaving. So even though he had managed to survive the data lockup, he's losing revenue. He's losing clients. His reputation has been damaged. And what you see when you look at the statistics is roughly 40 to 60% of businesses go out of business within two years after a significant cyber attack. Wow. Uh, and I, I guess the fictitious story about Joe's accounting firm, I think, and I hope that he survived, <laughs> but uh, he, it was, it, it's going to be a significant, very expensive healing process that if he had just spent a minuscule amount of money over the years, it never would have happened in the first place. And that's the biggest educational hurdle we have. I, I can hear a lot of experience, not just in technology and cybersecurity and, and what's happening in the world right now, but also there's a lot of different ways to sell uh, cybersecurity uh, MSP services. Uh, the way you walked me through that story, I was able to put myself uh, in each of those places and go, oh yeah, I have a backup. Oh wait, yeah, you're right. The backup, you know, will fail. Oh, oh, I didn't think about the customers. Wait, the customers would leave. So, um, yeah, I love that. <laughs> yeah, love, well, and and Jeremy, there's another there's another thing that I spend a lot of time on besides governance. I, we were talking about governance long before we even knew NIST was talking about it. Okay, because none of that works without policies and procedures and administration controls or administrative controls, and that's governance. You know. People think governance has got a government word, but no, mm -hmm. it's corporate governance, right? Policies and procedures and administrative controls. But another thing is people also think, well, my IT team will solve it, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. that, that's a different specialty. That's a different objective. Companies invest in IT infrastructure, skills, people, to maximize return on investment, make the company more profitable, make them make more money, make them more productive and efficient. Your IT investment is about making that company more money. If it's done right, it's an investment. Security investment, the ROI is, if it's done right, it's always going to be negative. On that P&L every month, it's always going to be negative if it's done effectively and you never have a breach. But what kind of price can you put on the very existence of your accounting firm, your law firm? How much will those fines be in your doctor's office or your dental office for HIPAA violations and patient oh, yeah. records and identity theft ramifications and fallout? And we're seeing a big increase in class action lawsuits to the smallest professional firms out there. You got 50 patients, you have a data breach, all their data is exposed. Every attorney in town will take that with 50 clients to represent. So it, it, I, I, I want to draw that distinction because, and, and any good IT professional knows this, right? They, they are relieved. If, if I, InfoSec is not their true specialty, they are relieved that they don't have that burden of responsibility. Yeah. I think a lot of uh, the challenges that MSPs in our community face is making clients care um, and, and, and justify uh, the, the work. And I don't know, after hearing you, I, I really care. <laughs> I care a lot. I have a lot of very concrete reasons why I care and I, I really relate uh, to everything you said. Um, so, so Kinsey, uh, you, were, you mentioned before along your sales process you mentioned uh, risk assessments. I'd love to understand how uh, do you and your team use risk assessments? What exactly do you assess? Uh, and what is the result of that uh, within your sales process? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so we use, um, 
I don't remember the name of the software we use, but we do have something that we use where uh, my sales guy, well, to start, we do offer the free security and risk assessment. And depending on the size of their business, they may or may not need it if they're smaller. Sometimes it's more of ask them some simple questions and we can figure it out. But if they're a bigger business, you know, we're going to look at their whole IT network and cybersecurity side of things. What do they have? What do they not have? If they do have something, what is it? Is it good? Is it best of breed? We're always saying best of breed because we want, of course, like the best out there uh, for whatever it is. And we give them a detailed report um, at, well, a separate meeting. We'll give them a detailed report um, telling them exactly um, what they need, like giving them recommendations. Uh, We have on there like why uh, what they're using is not good or why it's good. And uh, we just lay it out on paper for them. Of course, they don't have to move forward with us if they don't want to. But, you know, we do say, hey, we can provide these services for you. Um, and then from there, if they do decide to move forward with us, awesome, we'll uh, generate a quote based off of that assessment. And the assessment itself, it's something, you know, that you can put in someone's hands. So if they have a board of directors or something, it's something they can actually share around um, and refer for back to year upon year, you know, have we improved on our security? Have we gotten worse on our security? Yep. So, very interesting. Yeah, yeah I, I, it, it, it uh, stuck out to me because, um, yeah, I noticed there's a lot of synergies. So shameless plug uh, for Telavi for our audience. Um, you know, we have a risk assessment widget that our MSPs use to basically put on their homepage. Hey, get your free risk assessment. Same way you guys are utilizing this in your sales mm-hmm. process. Yeah. Uh, and visitors or people you met at an event or uh, people from social media or, or uh, who are checking out your website interested, they click, oh, I'll get a free risk assessment and, and their basic info, their website domain. Um, and what, what Telebi does that is also goes into the, the technology stack, your um, scans and ports and breach passwords and very, very... Um, you know, identifies if you have had a past breaches in your timeline, um, dollar amounts of, of what's your risk of breach uh, that we calculate based on the data that you have. Um, and that information goes to the MSP owner and it's like a like a lead gen. It's like a, oh, here's a lead list and, and here's my sales calls. Of, and I know exactly what we're going to talk about. Um, so, yeah, very, very uh, uh, interested in, in the synergy there. Um, I want to switch gears now uh, to learn a little bit more about about, about you guys. Uh, first with Tom, uh, 30 years in the industry, uh, over 30 years, um, we'd love to understand what's your founding story uh, of the company and the team? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Um, well, I got laid off from a software development company, uh, pretty successful at the time. I got laid off after the dot-com bust. And I found out that an economics major without a college degree that was a software designer in a small town in Arkansas is uh, not going to get employed after the dot-com days. So I became an entrepreneur uh, in much the same way this described in the book, The E-Myth, right? I'm sure many of your listeners have read that book and so it or wasn't lived it right because we recently had a bunch of tech layoffs and the global economic downturn last year and a ton of entrepreneurs coming out yeah msp right too yeah i i had i needed income right and so that's how i started it mm-hmm. and uh and and so we've grown it into what it is today and learned a lot over the years and uh i i'm Kenzie will probably be surprised to hear me this hear this word, but I am very I take a very disciplined approach to understanding what my role is, and how do I master the roles that I need to provide at that point in time with the company. And so, it's like you know, in the MSP, it's typically the guy, the tech guy, the tech expert that starts the company. But as you grow, you realize sales and marketing is so important. You realize that you're you realize making sure you bring on clients that their culture matches with you mm-hmm. and hopefully it's both of them are healthy cult- cultures right and it's understanding you have to give up control that's that's one of the problems with bootstrapping a company one man shop that really wants to grow it and help everyone in the company succeed and not just the clients succeed and that's kind of a short way of c- compressing kind of what I've lived through in the last 20 plus years but uh 
the, there, there's just so much that goes into it. Um, and uh, I, th I think an important point for me was to understanding what my job is or what my role, what hat am I wearing now as opposed to what it was 15 years ago and doing the best I can in that role. And that helps you make that transition from being a truly effective, you know, technician to be in a truly effective marketing guy, the president, the leader, or the manager of the organization. And uh, I, I, do I do everything right? No, of course not. I've got, I've got a good staff that pick me up, you know, pick up my slack when I'm 15 minutes for an interview, 15 minutes <laughs> late for an interview. Uh, I, I just, you know, and, and it's like, okay, hire the best. How do I go about doing that? How do I get people that fit in with the culture? How do I get them to follow the culture and lead them down a path to success and really tap into their superpowers and get everybody aligning in the same direction? If that, if there's one thing that I would advise my peers, I guess, for lack of a better term, and the leaders and the managers of MSPs or MSSPs or, or any business really is, is understand yourself and how best can you fit in and one of my favorite techniques is to use a servant leadership model to where, you know, that, that head honcho thing, you know, pulling a Jeff Bezos, Bezos <laughs> deal where you're in a meeting and he's trying to push something through that he's got too many objections through. And he finally falls back on, do I need to go get the corporate paperwork and, and, and show you guys who runs this place? You know, that, that's what, that's a well-known story that he's done at Amazon. It's, that's not what about it is. It's about being a collaborative effort, effort. And if you're truly a servant leadership, you want to drive everyone's, not only company success, but their life success. You know, what's your goals? If it's not here, that's fine. Let's make it work together as long as we're blessed to have you, right? Let's work towards your goals. <clears throat> People come and go. We don't get lifetime jobs anymore. Yeah. You know, when I was 20 years old, that, you know, that's what I was told. You go to work for a big company and work there all your life and you retire and you got a nice, you know, a nest egg. And uh, we don't live in those times anymore for the most part. So you've got to be a lifelong learner and understand your own weaknesses. What's your vulnerabilities? You're doing your own risk assessment on your own life. Absolutely. I, I feel like every business owner, every entrepreneur, or anybody who grows uh, their skill set within their industry experiences this where the role that you have changes over time. Your role today is different from 15 years ago. There's a lot of challenges that come with that, and we've faced a lot of the challenges ourselves personally. I, I like what you mentioned about, actually, that was going to be my question, was how do you what, one, what are the challenges of that transition? And two, uh, how do you overcome that? You mentioned, really st uh, struck a chord with me, which was understand where you fit uh, and, and, and sort of go from there. But um, is, 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 is that what you learned from, from that experience? Is, is, you know, as your role changes, as you have to learn something new, like sales marketing, for example, or hire new talent, um, is, is that your starting place? It was, uh, I had a, uh, an incident in my life besides being going on an ISIS kill list. That was the capper for everything that oh, happened to okay. me. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's a different story, different time, different place. There's, I'm sure there's YouTube videos of that story. Uh, and I know everybody wants to hear it. So just send me an email or whatever afterwards and be yeah. happy to tell you. But we'll, we'll, we'll do an, we'll do another interview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Since I messed this one up, but no, no, no. uh, uh, but I had the luxury of putting somebody in place in the company when I was going through a lot of personal tragedy in my life. And when it was over with, because of that luxury of having somebody that could pick up my slack and run the company for me, I had reflection time. And it gave me that time to really think about not only my weaknesses and strengths, but what, what do I really want out of my life for the next, you know, whatever, 20, 30, 40 years, hopefully. And what, what, what kind of company do I want to have? What kind of people do I want to surround myself with? Hmm. What, what do I envision for my 
clients? What can I do the best for them that we possibly can? And what does that take to get to all those different objectives? And because that's fulfillment and happiness. And so it, it gave me clarity of thought. And then I started doing tactical executions. How do I become a real marketing expert? What, what's my role as president? What are my duties then? Now, now it's what's my duties now as CEO? Kinsey thinks about what's her duties as chief marketing officer. And it, it's a way of thinking. Now, she may have ideas that's operations or client experience or finance, the same mm -hmm. way with me. Uh, and, and when you've got the right culture, it's, it's all collaborative. Everybody's swimming in the same direction or flying in the same formation you know, going south for the winter. Uh, and, and, and everybody understands that they are, it's not them. It, that role does not define them. Number one, they've earned it. Even no matter what you're, if you're an intern, you've earned that role. And it all, this is another key takeaway that took me decades to learn. It all starts with the hiring. Hmm. If you're not investing time up front, and getting to truly know who you're hiring, you're going to waste a ton of money and your time and their time and all of that. It, you've really got to invest time into making sure you're hiring. Do the best you can. It doesn't always work. But this hiring warm bodies thing, that's not a good tactic, you know. But then you've got to take it one more step. And I'm. this is personal experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you look that person in the eye and you offer them a job, you've got to make sure they know that this entire management team, everybody that works in this company want you to succeed in your role at this company. And we're going to invest time, money, and energy into helping you achieve that. Okay. Otherwise it's a waste of everyone's time and money. And we make a commitment to it and we back it up with actions. And, and and it saves so much time and money, and you end up with people that are just wonderful to work with. And uh, it, it almost sounds cultish, but, <laughs> but you know, there are good aspects to cults, right? I mean, <laughs> it, 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 those are things. I'm not uh, saying you should be in a cult. Yeah, but, I, uh, I didn't think our conversation not... would have included <laughs> talking about the benefits of cults today, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, they are. They, you know, they do have tactics. You know, and it's, you know, it's not like we're depriving people of protein, right? You know, <laughs> so, uh, but but it does lead to happier clients. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows what the purpose is, yeah. and you know, it's that servant leadership, stakeholder capitalism, all these concepts that we believe in as a as a company, and and try our best. I fail. Kinsey fails. Everybody fails at certain points. But, you know, you, if you just strive for perfection, you're going to achieve excellence, right? Yeah, I, I think I think the culture makes a ton of sense. And and speaking of uh, hiring, uh, Kinsey, something we, we talked about before we uh, started the podcast. How uh, did you how what was your journey uh, joining uh, Kirkham? And I also wanted to ask. So did you were originally from Arkansas, but you're in Hon Hon <clears throat> Honolulu now. What's the story of uh, <clears throat> moving to Honolulu? Uh, so when COVID hit, I started working from home and I hadn't, I don't even know how many times I went to the office like that first year of COVID, but it was very <laughs> few. And uh, I just asked Tom, I was like, you know, Hawaii is my happy place. So do you be opposed? <laughs> and he was like, go wow. for it. So I've been out here two and a half years now. So. What, what do you love most about Hawaii? <laughs> the weather. <laughs> it's <laughs> perfect. All the time, never cold, never too hot. Oh, that's amazing. The food is amazing too, and oh, yeah. Yeah, it's one of the most beautiful places in, in the world. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, as we get to the end of the, our podcast, I do have a couple of final questions. Uh, Tom, can you tell us a little bit about the books in your background? Is there a story behind that? That's a great question. Uh, well, you know, like, you know, it's it's like what is it called authoritative press you know you, you establish your authority by writing a book right and i'm the guru on the 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 first one was a cyber pandemic up in the uh upper right corner uh the green cover uh and so that was what started the whole thing right 
So that's a good intro to doing educational webinars and things like that. And it's just a method and or a tactic for effective marketing. You that ought, right or wrong, you're established as an expert because you wrote the book on it, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I loved it so much that I wrote another book and it's called Hack the Rich. Now, and, and this is about the special needs of high net worth individuals is because most of our clients, most of these companies have not high net worth individuals in them. If it's just the owner, that's fine. But some of these companies, you'd be shocked how many of them are what's considered wealthy people. You know, high net worth is, and even I was shocked at what the, 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 the threshold was. It's basically, if you've got a million dollars liquid assets, I'm not talking about real estate, it's got to be cash or stocks, something that's very, very liquid. You're considered, you're considered high net worth individuals. So you, you know, lots of companies have high net worth individuals. Well, what makes the books unique is I didn't write these for my peers. These are written for business owners and mm -hmm. attorneys and accountants and, you know, uh, mechanics, you know, and, and I knew I had to keep their attention. You know, it, if I'm sitting here, that's gibberish that all of us tech people know, you know, EDR and SCADA devices and ICS, you know, you, you know what it is, right? That's how us nerds know we the ranking order, <laughs> right? Who knows the most acronyms? Yeah. Uh, but I knew it, it, if it was all sprinkled out there and I probably made some technical errors that people would take exception with, but I didn't write that for InfoSec professionals, right? I didn't write it for FBI agents mm -hmm. or or NSA guys, U.S. Cyber Command, or IT professionals. I wrote it for that business owner that really just needs that 50,000-foot view of what to look for in order to get the right company to help his company. So I put a fictional component in there. And the main character's name is Sunju Lu. And he's kind of a gray hat hacker. So in both of those books, there's stories. And then we illustrate the failures to point out the weaknesses and the defenses, the weaknesses and the remediation and the mitigation of security events and other things that, that these two different breaches were the, you know, the faults, you know, and, and we use that to make business lessons to get it in the owner's mind that if you do this, this is what's going to happen. And, and this has led into a whole series of books because I'm in the middle of a much bigger one now that, Oh, that's really it's going to have a lot grand, a lot grander scope to it. Yeah, it's not, it's almost turning into a second career, but or third, fourth <laughs> career, whatever you want to say. So, I, I'm I'm curious to learn from you. I'm noticing a, a connection, a common thread. The Joe's story you mentioned earlier was fictional. Hack the rich is fictional. Both of these stories are targeted towards business owners, uh, you know, attorneys, you know, things like that. Was this an intentional choice to approach your messaging uh, and educational messaging uh, via uh, fictional medium? And, and if so, why? Well, I enjoyed getting back to the E-Myth book, right? That, that I really connected. What is that, 20, 30 years old? Uh, I really connected with that book because there's that fictional component. And I think it was in a bookkeeping firm or an accounting firm, if I remember. It's been a while since I read it. But they were talking about the business book component of it, right? But the author, who escapes my mind right now, the author used that story to keep my attention. So the, the, the readers of this, I, I mean, when you look at the feedback, and they're both Amazon number one bestsellers in their category, but when you read the reviews, you see people that, some of them I personally know that we didn't plant the review in their mouth that run a business that has nothing, they know zero about IT and cybersecurity, don't want to know anything about cybersecurity. And you see something that says couldn't put the book down. Now, that, that business component sunk in at some point. That cybersecurity stuff sunk in, sunk in at some point, but the point was she couldn't put the book down and that was the educational component that I try to deliver in every webinar every educational session every podcast television interview whatever it may be 
I try to bring that component to it to keep people's attention. How many people outside of our industry really want to hear an IT guy talk about IT? <laughs> I mean, really and truly. I mean, that's like eyes roll back in their heads. I don't want to know anything about it. I'm too old to learn, blah, blah, blah. You know, we've all been through it. it, it we got family members, right? And uh, how, so how do you keep their attention and, and really get them to understand things that should be important to them? I think, again, that takes so much experience and customer empathy and sales maturity to approach things that way. And I'm, I learned so much just from just from talking to, to you, too. Um, and I just want to say thank you for 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 sharing your your knowledge, your experience, your um, approach and wisdom uh, with our audience today. The last last question here is, uh, uh, do you have a, a final plug? Uh, who should reach out to you and what's the best way to reach you? Uh, well, for, for Kenzie, Kenzie, you want to handle that? Yeah, um, just you can email us at info at Kirkham Iron Tech dot com. Um, Kirkham Iron Tech dot com is our website. Mm, yeah, just reach out. Yeah, pay, pay attention to the Kirkham spelling so you get that <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. Yep, and links will be in the description. And last plug uh, for me. Uh, hey, folks, are you an MSP and want to win new clients and capture new prospects on your homepage with our risk assessment widget? Reach out to us today at telebee.com and special promotion for podcast listeners. If you know an MSP owner or sales or marketing person who could benefit from winning new prospects, connect us over email uh, at contact at telebee.com. When your referral becomes a Telebee partner, you receive your $500 referral bonus. All right. So thank you all so much uh, for speaking with us today. Uh, it's been a pleasure and we'll see you all next time. All right. Thank you. Thank it's you. our pleasure.